So hello everyone. I'm happy to welcome all of you to our 44th edition in the webinar series on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. My name is Klaus Blaum from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Klaus Wendt from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. But before doing so, I would like to announce that this seminar is given to celebrate the 80th birthday of Jürgen Kluge, who turned last Sunday 80, a new known expert in the field of precision mass spectrometry and laser spectroscopy experiments. So let me say a few words about the scientific achievements and the numerous awards and honors Jürgen Kluge has received in the past decades. I know that he doesn't like that, so I will be a bit brief here. So uh, let me start with uh, the scientific achievements. In fact, I found this photo, uh, Klaus Wendt will show it as well. That's Jürgen Kluge in front of a physics board. And if you look carefully, already a number of his scientific achievements are visible in this photo. You might not know it, Jürgen, but uh, what I identified here is a kind of a Ramsey pattern. Jürgen Kluge was the one who first installed a penning graph mass spectrometer at a radioactive ion beam facility 30, 35 years ago ago that was the isograph facility at CERN. And uh, a couple of years later, he uh, used the Ramsey method for time-separated oscillatory fields for high-precision penning grab mass spectrometry. That is one of his uh, real successes in this field. You see also on this slide ME, which is the electron mass. And Jürgen Kluge is known for that he uh, determined uh, yeah, 20, 20 years ago for the very first time by a uh, measurement of the G factor of the bound electron in hydrogen-like highly charged ions, a uh, fundamental constant, namely the mass of the electron that was achieved in collaboration with uh, Günther Wert from the University of, Ma of, of Mainz. I also see in this slide a gamma. I assume that this is the, uh, the Lorentz factor, which also is a hint towards the science Jürgen Kluge has done in the past uh, decades, namely precision experimental tests of special relativity by laser spectroscopy, among others uh, here in Heidelberg, the TSR, but also at GSI in the ESR with, uh, with Renata Seuser, for example, Dirk Schwalm and others. And you see on the right-hand side that the word laser, Jürgen is also known for his uh, highly selective laser experiments and also for his technical developments he has pushed forward in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Among others, he invented a novel scheme for highly selective laser ion source. In fact, together with Klaus Wendt, our today's speaker at the ISOL facility. That was done with numerous uh, great colleagues. And I found a few older photos of Jürgen, uh, where here you see, for example, his colleague Ernst Otten, Gerd Huber, and Ludwig Kugler in the uh, control room of the ISOL uh, facility. At that time, it was allowed to smoke and to drink. So it's, it's nice to see the, the old photos. This is uh, Lutz Schweikart, with whom he shares uh, close to 100 publications. This is the celebration of the 30th birthday of the Isotrap facility. And uh, this was, I think, a photo taken when he retired about 10 years ago with the colleagues uh, Fritz Bosch, Günther Wert is visible, Wolfgang Quint, Karl-Heinz Langanke, and many others. So he uh, had great colleagues for the past, past decades. Concerning honors and awards, uh, Jürgen Kluge received in 1990 the Helmholtz Award of the German Metrology Institute, the PDB in Braunschweig, together with his colleague Norbert Krautmann, you see here from the Nuclear Chemistry Department at the University of Mainz, another long-term uh, colleague of, of, of Jürgen. He uh, was uh, um, honored with the Fellow of the American Physical Society in 2005, he received the highest uh, European award for nuclear physics, the Lisa Meitner Prize of the European Physical Society in 2006, the Flerov Prize of the National Research Institute in Dubna, together with uh, Michael Block, uh, Yuri uh, Novikov, and myself. And just last year, Jürgen received the Robert Richard Pohl Prize of the German Physical Society. With that, I think I've honored him enough. All our best wishes, dear Jürgen. Happy birthday to you from good friends and true from old friends and new. May good luck go with you and happiness too. And with that, all the best. And this is now a private personal remark, a poor Malenko hand. Jürgen, that's what I wish when we play Skat again together. Okay, this is 
the end of the introduction of uh, Jürgen Kluge's 80th birthday. With that, I continue by introducing our today's speaker. So I return to uh, Klaus Wendt. He's an outstanding scientist and leading expert in the field of resonance ionization, laser spectroscopy and radionuclides for atomic and nuclear physics applications, as well as, as, well as for ultra phase analysis. Klaus has obtained his PhD at the University of Mainz in the group of Ernst Otten on the hyperfine structure and isotope shift in radium. After several years as postdoctoral research fellow at CERN, he became permanent scientist at the University of Mainz. He is the principal investigator of the laser resonance ionization for spectroscopy and selective trace analytics project. Since 2007, he is an associate professor at the Institute of Physics at the Mainz University. And uh, personally, I also feel proud to say that I was one of his PhD students uh, about uh, 20 years ago. To the audience, as usual, in case you have questions, please type them into the chat room or the question and answer box. We will address them at the end of the talk. Already hear the announcement of the next talk in a week from now. Don't miss that. That will be Sergei Eliseev on ultra high precision mass measurements with the Pender Prep experiment at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. Klaus, we appreciate very much that you will give this colloquium in honor of the 80th birthday of Jürgen Kluge, who has influenced our field of precision physics so tremendously over the past decades. We are looking now forward to your presentation on high resolution laser spectroscopy on exotic isotopes from ultra trace determination to the atomic and nuclear structure of the heaviest nuclides. The floor is yours. Let's try to get it going. The screen is visible. The voice is to be heard. The voice, yes, the screen not. Now. Now it's coming. Is it perfect? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Good. Then welcome everybody. The first quarter of an hour is already over and Klaus has stolen a few of my nice pictures. You see that even my start picture. I have nicely cut Jürgen a little bit more in detail so I could remove all his famous achievements in physics and just uh, stick to the person of Jürgen. And I want to honor him and I feel very, very proud and very happy. It's a big pleasure once to be in this great seminar organized by this little diploma student who started with gadolinium in my group and who would never who would with whom I without whom I would never have achieved what I have managed to achieve and the second pleasure obviously is to give this talk in the honor of Jürgen my big mentor and friend and already introduced me into a solder as group leader at that time and we had many 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 joint activities and I really feel honored that I have the the possibility to give him a nice scientific talk. And I was asked to only speak about scientific science. So I will just try to keep into this direction. This is the outline. I will motivate what I'm talking about by deriving atomic and nuclear physics along the nuclear chart. And I will focus as Klaus already mentioned with lasers I will also cover a little bit of traps and obviously we cannot avoid mass spectrometers, but we can avoid high precision mass spectrometers and panning traps, fortunately. Theoretically, I will start with discussing the specific role of high resolution resonance ionization in the, diff in the possible applications in source and also elsewhere. Then I will a little bit talk about technical and facilities dedicated off and online resonance ionization beam facilities, laser ion source arrangements, and names are, Klaus already mentioned it, Realis, LIST, and beyond for high resolution spectroscopy. It was quite hard to select results because we don't want to talk up or stay, stay in this webinar for hours. Some data on most exotic spaces from in-source spectroscopy, and obviously I have to start somewhat with the primeval days of spectroscopy when even Jürgen was still young. And I want to go up to the red hot data when today even the lecture starts to sometimes feel somewhat old. A successful lateral arabesque on that way on doing high, spe high resolution spectroscopy is obviously the selective ultra trace analysis 
and to honor the contribution of Jürgen, we should definitely not let this lateral arabesque out of the talk. And our present goal is always towards the higher end of the nuclear chart where we find the actinides. And if I look at my friend and colleague, Michael Block and Christ Christoph Dullmann, then we also come into the direction of the super heavy elements. We will not be able to fully avoid that. And finally, we start with, we stop with a summary and outlook. So right direction or wrong direction? So this is the right direction. What is the reason to do laser spectroscopy and to explore and understand the narrow continent of elements? It's the chart of nucleids, which gives us, unfolds the path from the Big Bang to the world around us. And what we only have to do, which is fairly simple, we have to explore the structure and the characteristics of nuclear matter. We just have 256 stable nuclei, so this is peanuts. We have extremely rare few radioisotopes in nature, 83, but we have about 3,000 known nuclei. These are the uh, pink ones here. The green ones with all the red question marks, this is the terra incognita. This is where we do not know how the narrow continent of elements is formed and how the behavior of nuclear matter is under these extreme conditions when the ratio of neutrons and protons no longer makes a nucleus stable, but has a very short half-life and is extremely unstable, far off beta stability. The approach I'm using since long is laser spectroscopy on exotic isotopes, which are the purple, the, the pink ones, and into the green ones. And they give us access to the major nuclear ground state properties. These properties are fairly simple. It's the nuclear spin. Something should appear now, yes. And for the nuclear spin, it does not move. How come? It should move. Okay, it does not move. Uh, the nuclear, it, it moves really rapidly, Klaus, it was good. Here, here it comes. The nuclear spin is one quantity. The magnetic dipole moment, which is a single particle property of the nucleus. The electrical quadrupole moment, which is a collective deformation factor of the nucleus. And finally, the nuclear charge radius variation, delta R square, which gives us the size and the shape of the nucleus. And as you see, if we would do this research on, on hydrogen, it would be rather boring. If you go further towards the super heavy elements and I, or to the octinites, I brought plutonium here, then you see your understanding of what bubbles around here in the center of the atom, which is the nucleus, is really complicated by the complicated atomic structure. And this complicated structure is the understanding, the atomic physics is the prerequisite for understanding afterwards the nuclear physics. So fortunately, many, many people have worked in this direction within the last 50 years. And one of the leading one was Jürgen Kluge, together with Wilfried Nertersäuser, with Jens Stilling. And here we see again the nuclear chart and we see this red isotopes. These are the isotopes which have already been studied by laser spectroscopy and where these parameters I was just mentioning have been deduced from the atomic physics spectrum. I will show you on the next slide how they are deduced in case you are a non-expert in our field. So the understanding of nuclear structure is carried out through resonant interaction between laser light and atoms. And the understanding of nuclear structure has brought quite a number of nice information and of puzzling information. For example, in the first very low mass region, we find this extremely interesting charge ready of halo nuclei, so this is lithium 11, which has this nucleus where we have two neutrons just surrounding on a far orbit the central core of the nucleus. Another 
very interesting field is the proof of isomerism, the shape coexistence, which was found in the 65 nickel region. And so this nucleus more or less cannot decide if it has a brolate or an oplate deformation. It is even more funny if we go into the cadmium region there we find this triaxial nuclear shapes, which look a little bit like a banana. It's not, it's not a surprise that this nucleus is colored in yellow. And if you go further, then we find we know the nuclear matter has this magic numbers, but we do know that 64 is not a magic number. Nevertheless, we find a nuclear substrate closure. And in the middle of the lanthanide atoms, we find an almost spherical nucleus unexpectedly, and we find rapid shape transitions. And the very interesting thing I will focus later on is the occurrence of flip-flop behavior of neighboring isotopes which is found very early by our celebrity Jürgen in Mercury. And we have a prolat shape. We have, this is a prolat, this is oplat shape, and they're just neighbors to each other. Klaus mentioned that I did my work on my PhD work, my thesis in the radium, radium region. And at that time, which is now 35 years ago, we discovered that we also have this pear shape and this pear shape was very funny at the time when we had Chancellor Kohl in Germany. It fitted very well that we discovered that even radium has a well-known shape for that time. If you further go up into the region of the actinides to a, towards the super heavies, then we find all kinds of fission isomer and all kinds of strange shapes. And we really have to work in this field because there's many open question marks. The primary prerequisite for all these studies and all these discoveries here is that you somehow produce your exotic isotopes, which are far away from stability to give you big information. Uh, they should be isobarical pure, prepared. And first of all, they should be prepared and then they should be delivered in isobarical pure uh, form. In addition, we have to do a high resolution spectroscopy studies on these rare and commonly very short lived species. And once again, the knowledge of the atomic structure is the key to understanding the nuclear physics. Why is that so? Because here is a very simple atomic spectrum. And this very simple atomic spectrum is given by the Rutberg Ritz formula down here. So you have this different excitation st stages, uh, different excitation levels. And if you look more precise into it, then you find, oh, the electron has an orbital angular momentum and a spin angular momentum, they couple to the total angular momentum. You have some so-called fine structure splitting, for example, here in this level two. So the rough energy distribution is from level to level, always between one and 10 electron volts. The fine structure between these fine structure terms in the order of 10 to the minus one to 10 to the minus three electron volts. And if you still look more precise, you find that even these individual levels are split up into sub levels, which are the hyperfine structure. And where does this come from? This is a coupling between the orbital angular momentum, no, the total angular momentum of the electron and the nuclear spin, which couples to the total angular momentum of each isotope and of each level of F, and this is these numbers here at the side. And if I calculate the energies and I find two very specific factors, an A factor and a B factor, and here you see the coupling between the nuclear magnetic moment and the electromagnetic moment, or as I would say, the nuclear magnetic moment, and the field, the magnetic field, which is created by the orbital orbiting electron over there. And if I look at these factors A and B, then I find a represents the magnetic dipole moment and B represents the quadrupole moment, always multiplied either with the magnetic field created by the electrons at the location of the nucleus or with the deviation, the second deviation of the electric field in the perpendicular direction to the um, rotating frame of the nucleus. So in this way, we can determine 
three very interesting quantities. First of all, we can determine this I, so it should actually be red, so the nuclear spin. We can determine the magnetic dipole and the electric quadrupole moment, but the effect is pretty small. I said 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven electron volts. You can immediately convert this with the calculator provided by a laser company, and you figure out it's in the order of 10 megahertz. So we have to have high spectral resolution of better than 10 megahertz. Another factor I mentioned before is if you look at different isotopes, and if you just forget about the hyperfine structure, then you just figure out the isotopes have different locations of their individual excitation steps. And this is called the resonance frequency shift along change of isotopes, there's an E missing here, sorry, or just short the isotope shift. And the isotope shift has altogether three factors. This is the normal mass shift, which is just the, the uh, yeah, it's the same problem like the, the mercury traveling around the sun. So this is a two-body uh, two movement that the heavy body, the nucleus, is also not standing still, but moving in a two-particle problem. In addition, unfortunately, we don't only have one electron. We have numerous electrons. They know each other, and they somehow have this correlation of their movement. So we get a factor which is easily to calculate, the normal mass shift factor. We have a factor which is almost impossible to calculate, which is a specific mass shift factor, which comes from all the correlations of all the different electrons. And we have a finite size of the nucleus. And if we have the finite size of the nucleus, then the Coulomb potential is no longer a Coulomb potential, but at the edge of the nucleus, it is just cut off to a much much higher value than the negative infinity, which the point charge would have. In this way, your levels are shifted by an uh, electronic factor F multiplied with the change of the nuclear charge, mean square charge radii difference or between, between isotope A and A prime. And so what we can learn is the isotope shift gives us the changes in mean stress charge radius, this delta R square. And in addition, we can verify, is it odd bigger than even, or is it even bigger than odd, or I would say of the average of the two. And so we get something which is an odd even staggering of the mean square charge radii. If it is inverted, it tells us something about a very fancy deformation of the nucleus. So what we learn is size and deformation of the atomic nucleus. And we see it is very hard to measure this for the light elements. So the isotope shift is pretty small. The field shift is pretty small for light elements and is pretty big for heavy elements. And the opposite way around, the mass shift decreases very much with re uh, relative to the field shift uh, with the mass of or the atomic number, which is not really proportional, but is a growth in the same direction. And so measuring lithium 11 was really a burden and measuring field shifts in plutonium is pretty easy if you have plutonium. So again, the size of this effect for lithium 11, it's still below 10 megahertz. For plutonium, it's above 10 gigahertz. And along the nuclear chart, it's somewhere in this range of three orders of magnitude. And so we can have high resolution, but also from resolving this shift here, which we see here in the ground state, we can generate highest optical isotope selectivity. And I think the highest number published is by Peter Müller and Bruce Bouchard. And this was in 2001 on calcium 41. So Klaus mentioned I did the radium, so I have to show radium because radium is not really an actinite, but not so far away. And this is pretty old data. It's 35 years old and it shows everything I explained to you in the theory before. It shows you huge hyperfine structure. Here the isotope 213 has a huge hyperfine structure of 25 gigahertz on the transition, which is 4683, which is the ion transition from the ionic ground state to the first excited 
state in the ion. We also have measured in radium, we have measured numerous transitions. We also have measured the D1 line here in the, this is the D1 line. So here we have measured the two, the transition in the two electron system of 7s squared to the 7s7p. So this is a strong singlet line in the radium atom. And this is given here on the left-hand side. Here we see here, the hyperfine structure is much smaller, but in, in principle, the trend is identical because it's rather similar transitions. Just the lower one is diluted by this additional 7s electron, which reduces all the effects we see. So we have a nucleus, which is this size, and we see here indicated by these red lines that the odd even staggering in this range is strongly inverted. It goes into the negative one. If you don't believe me, I show you the next slide. Here we see the odd even staggering actually regularly is negative. Here it goes into the positive one. I just mis misinterpreted this. It depends if you see negative, uh, if you see odd to even or even to odd. And what we call this is the inversion of odd even staggering. And this is a very strong hint for this pear shaped octopole deformed nucleus, which I mentioned two slides ago. But if I look at this one, we see that this inversion of odd even staggering is even huge, much, much bigger discovered before. Everything is discovered before. So, and this is called the super inversion of flip flop nuclei. And who has measured this? This was people like Huber, Bonn, Jürgen, and Ernst Otten, or oh, EWW Otten, I didn't correct this. And here we see the original plot of the measurement, which was carried out 35 years, is this correct? No, 45 years ago, 45 years ago. And this is very funny because this is, I didn't say this is laser spectroscopy, because if you look in this experiment here, what you see is this is laser spectroscopy without a laser because the laser is replaced by this scanning lamp and what we do here is optical pumping and is very in a magnetic field. And with this technology already very, very early, very precise data and this fascinating, astonishing result in mercury could be obtained and made the field very, very famous. And this was so famous that you see 20 years later, in 10 years later, Gerhard Ulm, used the collinear machine at Isolde to just study one more isotope, this one isotope. We managed to obtain, I was in this collaboration, we managed to obtain 10 years later, you see, one isotope more. But I show you this historical results because this historical results and these technologies are still active today. But before that, I should introduce you a little bit to Isolde. And Klaus Blaum has shown this again already, this wonderful picture. And I add also this wonderful picture because it shows how important the publication was at the time, hand colored here. This is historical Isolde in 1986. And this is handwritten. This is very close. I suppose actually it could be Jürgen's handwriting. And here is this optical pumping experiment. And in 19 76, they could already look into the future because they already put in up here that isotrap will be coming in 1986. So the view into the future, this was sitting up there at the very beginning. And the experts, which already Klaus introduced, I think some of the audience knows, H minus J Clutch, EWO, and Gerard Hubert. And obviously Jim Beam was also in the collaboration and uh, I, I miss the, the cigarette a bit in this. So this was different times, but still today, we are now in the year 2018 and there was a nature physics by Bruce Marsh and many other authors published on mercury nuclei get back in shape. And what does it mean they get back in shape? Yes, after this region of the strong flip-flop nuclei where we have a strong prolate shape, just the side of the strong oblate shape, we just find 
they behave nicely, like they ought to behave, like isotopes should behave. So this is just a very short region. And at the very end of my talk, I will show you that this region, such a region also exists for other candidates. And even in 2021, pretty uh, recent, Tom Day Goodacre published that 207 and 208 that we see a nice little kink when we cross the when we cross the magic Newton number of n equals 126 here and add two more isotopes. So we see that mercury is still one of the most fascinating isotopic chains in the whole nuclear chart. And we also see that technology has tremendously increased. We have a laser-based ion source here. We have various different, a real collection of all the different realist lasers in the laser laboratory. We have a variety of different high technology detectors, the multi-reflecton time of flight mass spectrometer, the Leuven windmill detector, a, a standard Faraday cup. And with those extremely sensitive technologies and with also extremely selective devices where you can re remove all the ugly green and the ugly blue one and only get the nice red bunch of mercury isotopes, they can really go out so far into uh, instability of the stable isotopes. So this is the development which has been carried out since the last 40 years. And for those few people in the audience who don't know much about Isolde, you see Isolde is at the beginning in 1986 situation direct, directly here at the main entrance at the gate. There was a very little facility compared to all this big triangle of almost a square kilometer of CERN, of the main CERN area, but Isolde has grown or CERN has shrinked. And here is the new Isolde. And the new Isolde is funny but true, exactly sitting on the border between France and Switzerland. And you see here, here's the border. And obviously the experimental hall is in Europe. And the target area is just one of the mountains of Switzerland. It's actually not a big mountain, but it's a nice shielding mountain. And so it fits very well that the border goes exactly through almost through the target area and the proton beam comes from Switzerland and ends up in the mountain. And the important fact is that 50% of all the total accelerated protons of CERN are provided for isolder radioisotope production. So it's really a big share. And also compared to all the high energy physicists, it's almost the same number of publications that the 500 people of the Isolde community are generating in comparison to the thousands of people on the high energy side. And if you're really interested to see nice faces and very famous actors and actresses like Cara Lynch, then you should have a look at this nice movie here, Meet Isolde, Fresh Faces Bring Fresh Ideas, because public, uh, public relation is so important today and Isolde has wonderful marketing movies now and things like this. So look at, look at their principal actresses and not only at my nice slides here. So inside Isolde, we have the online mass separator. So we have high energy protons, one GeV coming in and hitting targets. Here's one target, target unit one. Here's target unit two, target unit one for the general purpose separator and target unit two for the high resolving mass separator with the two magnets, which are actually flying. This one is sitting nicely on a bench and these two are just flying. Here's a, the person who made the drawing, just forget to create stands. It's very funny, I like it each time I show it. And the interesting thing is that nowadays, nothing works without lasers. So we have to do the ion production with laser ion sources and in this, point we come into picture because the laser ion sources are strongly uh, influenced by activities at mines. And there are obviously also some experiments and uh, post accelerator and I show you the experience on this slide. And again, you see Isolde is somewhat influenced by laser spectroscopy. 
So this was also a fault of Jürgen when he removed the optical pumping and replaced it by pulsed lasers. And these lasers seemingly invaded every second experiment at least. So behind the wall, we have the RELIS, the resonance ionization laser ion source, which delivers mid in-source spectroscopy capabilities presently, and I hope soon it will deliver high resolution in-source spectroscopy capabilities. Then number two, I would call Gris sitting over here, the Colinda laser resonance ionization, which is pretty close to the technology of RELIS. Then very historical since ages and always very successful, the Collapse Colinda laser spectroscopy rather new the work on negative ions, the Gandalf system with collinear negative ion photo detachment. Further new the VITO experiment, laser ion is ion beam polarization. And one of the big working horses, I would say Klaus Blaum's ISO trap, this is correct. Someone feels uh, angry about this. I, I nevertheless state Klaus was so busy on this one. And we also have the Rex post accelerator and Nicole sitting here on these beam lines, which are experiments without lasers, if you believe it or not. And there is what is Isolde standing for. It's the online isotope factory. And as I said, we have about 3,100 radioisotopes to study and to discover. And Isolde delivers something like 800 isotopes, 800 different isotopes with beam strengths in the order of 10 to the minus one isotope per second up to 10 to the 13 isotopes, very few 10 to the 13s, just these two there. But also some ranges are not accessible. And these are the ones where the spallation, the fragmentation and fission reactions of the initial material does not deliver nuclei by 1 GV proton bombardment. And this is obviously the range of the missing actinides. And in between here, there are some gaps, which are the refractory elements where the ion source does not work properly. So what we can do is radiative ion beam production in the range from helium-6 to 232 radium. We discovered it, I'm very proud of that. And we can deliver one to 10 to the 11 ions per second. And the half-lives, which can be studies, are about 10 milliseconds. And it's much easier to study stable ones. Good. What is the basic requirement of the ion beam production is beam purity. And I have one nice example here. We have, we want to produce tin because it's always a famous isotope for everyone, tin 100. So if you want to produce tin 100, then in tin, which is this yellowish points, which are bought here, you see this is a production. This is the different yields of the different neighboring isotopes with the mass settings as given below here. But if you, for example, have tin 100, then you have about 10 to the six times more silver 100, and you also have palladium 100. So this should be here in the box. If you're on the other side, at the other side end of the yield curve, if you produce tin 132, which is the most heavy tin isotope you can generate, then you have 102. This should be cesium. This S should be sitting there. Something goes wrong. So this is cesium isotope, which even further comes out very rapidly as an, as an alkaline. So what you need is you have to somehow suppress this rubbish up here to the ones you want, to the signal down here by at least 10 to the six orders of magnitude. And how do you do this? You need isobar selection. And the mass separator is pretty lousy in isobar selection because you don't want to operate it in a high resolution, mass resolution mode because then transmission is almost zero. So the dedicated technique for ionization and spectroscopy of, of spaces is the resonant ionization laser ion source. It works pretty simple. You start with the atom which evaporates out of your target. You, you bombard the poor atom with a photon, go into one excited step, go into another excited step and go beyond the ionization potential. And most fortunately, you go into outer ionizing states because then the whole process is pretty efficient. So, and 
the merits of this technology of the release is it's extremely universal. While all the other ion sources just prefer thumb elements and produce them well and others less, the laser ion source can generate isotopes almost all over the periodic system here, except maybe for this right upper corner where you have very high ionization potentials. All the others could be done and just the missing ones here, the super heavies is just because you have no clue about the atomic physics of the super heavies. And you can find all this information in the two databases. There is first the release elements web database, which was installed by Sebastian Rote. And there's a second base which shows you what triumph release the trellis, what they can do. And they also have a part of these isotopes belong to Triumph and the part belongs to, to Isolde. And I think they all can go with zero together and we exchange all this data. High ionization efficiency. This is a very important thing because the cross section, normally I focus on the cross section, is extremely large. The cross sections are in order to 10 to the minus 10 square centimeters. So this is huge uh, orders of magnitude of barns. And this is something uh, uh, high energy physicists just dreams about. And so this process can be extremely efficient with existing laser powers, even with very low power laser. And the important thing is because you have this fingerprint of this blue, yellow, red pattern, this whole thing is extremely elemental and also isotopically selective. So you can just choose plutonium-238 by putting your lasers on the right wavelengths and putting your mass spectrometer on 238. So we have obviously many versatile applications, ion production at offline and online mass separator. Ion potential, ionization potential can be determined very precise and atomic spectroscopy. If you need the atomic spectroscopy, the atomic excitation, you can certainly also just uh, study it. And the important thing which I'm talking about here is the nuclear structure analysis, the elemental ultra trace analysis. And these two are the only ones which require a higher optical resolution. And here I go back into the history because this is very fascinating history. In 1985, in 1984, we had this wonderful workshop at Sinal, which was really a marvelous place. And we still had this picture of the old Isolde and everyone was dreaming and planning of the new Isolde. And there was this Isolde program and one of the proposals by, by, by Flavia Letokov was the proposal of the development of a laser ion source. And you see the names here, here is Ernst Otten, here is Jürgen Kluge and our friends from Russia, Yuri Kutyachev, uh, I forgot his first name, Mr. Letokov. And the spokesperson was actually me. So that's why I like this very much because also this wonderful hand drawing of how a laser ion source looks like with all the different isolde beams which come out. This was done by me and this was hard, hard to do this at that time. I really appreciate it. And the principle here is very simple. You have your ion source, you shoot in the lasers, you bring in the atoms and out comes the ions and there you are all peanuts and nicely described in a publication in 93 for the first results. So it took from 85 or 80, 86 here, the proposal five years, and then it was there and it was running and it is still running very, very, very successful because just the number of lasers had to increase. It was all started with dye lasers as given on my hand drawing. Then the narrow band dye laser came into picture then a uh, computer started to read out the, the wave meter, everything got automized. And a while later, we had Sebastian Rote sent down to CERN installing the Mainz titanium sapphire laser system as uh, addition to the existing dye laser system. And now we have the entire complete laser system at Isolde and we can send more than six beams into the target and ion source unit. And this machine can really do very well. Here's a wonderful 
colored picture showing the dye, the dye lasers sitting up here, showing the titanium sapphire lasers sitting up here, showing the various pump lasers, CS1, and all the necessary optics and all the wonderful color which lasers can produce. But if you want to develop all this, you also need a development facility. And we were very fortunate at Mainz because there was just one standing around. And this one standing around was my so-called risico mass separator, which says resonance ionization in collinear geometry. And this resonance ionization machine is just fortunately a copy of the Isolde II front end. So it has the identical ion source region, the identical ion optics layout, and it's the optimum development tool for isolde release. And we have a rather small, nice to handle machine with which we can do a lot of things at home, but obviously the target sits here and there's no connection to any accelerator. So we are offline, but offline does not mean we cannot work on radioisotopes. We can work very nicely on radioisotopes as long as they are long-lived enough and as long as we are sensitive enough to have permission to handle them in our lab. So the RISICO is the optimum supporting and extension tool for exotic isotope studies. For example, extending in the direction of higher masses. So we can do laser and laser ion source development, for example, the LIST and the PI list. We can do isotope purification enrichment. We can do offline laser mass spectrometry of stable and of long-lived radioisotopes. And here's a list of isotopes we did, and I will cover a few of them in the talk. So actinides will come all at the end. We did some implantation of radium for emanation standards for the PTP. We are quite active in the ECHO project in implanting 163 holmium and avoiding 166 M holmium, but to avoid it, we also have to study it. I will talk about promethium. I will talk about technesium. I will not talk about strontium 89 and 90 because it would just make the whole talk explode, but we can do selective ultra trace analysis. We can implant a long lived, extremely long lived isotope 53 manganese for the mean core project of PSI. And one of the big, big activities on my, in my lab was calcium 41 also for ultra trace analysis purposes. So here are the isotopes, the red ones are the ones we are doing. And here's all the actinides, but we can just handle between the green line and the red line because the red line actinides and the super heavies, they are obviously only accessible again online. And the online activities are dominated at GSI with gas cell, with gas jet and with rudderless technology. And the experts in the field are Michael Block, Mustafa Lazio and Sebastian Reda. And there's a nice publication if you're interested in this. So having a look at my lab, Larissa, it is a little bit smaller than I sold. It is 120 square centimeter, but we squeeze in more lasers than I sold it has. So we have one fat laser system sitting behind this black curtain here. We have a central fat laser system with at least three to five lasers on the table. And we have a nice laser development system on the left hand side where we do something like seeding, direct laser pumping and those things. And what, what use would lasers have if you would not have this risico mass separator here it is again you see it has about eight meters beam line it's a high voltage 60, 60 kilowatt sector field machine and it is used for high efficiency high sensitivity spectroscopy and ion implantation and we have this very small protocol sitting down here which is a low voltage machine for the spectroscopic part and the important thing is all the laser development which we can provide we have this custom built pulsed titanium sapphire laser. And this was actually triggered by the plutonium activities of Jürgen Kluger, I have to admit. And for this reason, we knew we have to work on high repetition rate because otherwise we will never be efficient. And we have three different lasers designed. We have the standard laser, which is high power, which you see up here. It's a absolutely peanuts trivial design, but it is operating very, routinely, very steadily and very easily. 
Then we figured out this laser is not so good in tuning larger ranges, for example, for learning about different Rydberg series. So we installed a crating into the laser sitting here and replaced just the high reflector. So we have the wide range scanning device, a crating tuned laser, and we have a narrow band device, which obviously needs a single mode operation. So no longer a standing wave operation like the other ones, but a, a, a ring laser operation. And this is seeded by an external, either a diode laser or in recent days also a direct di diode driven HiSAF laser. So um, you see here the parameters. A standard laser has a lot of power and has a lot of line widths, which you don't like to have. It has a lousy tuning range because it is hopping. The grading tube laser has a little bit less power, has a huge tuning range, and has a reasonable line width. And the injection seeded has the tuning range of the, the seed laser, which is fairly small, but still not so bad and has a line width, which is dominated by the Fourier length of the pulse. So it's in the order of 20 megahertz. And just quite a number of people have contributed here. And I would just like to highlight Volker Sonnenschein, who is now our laser expert, our in sitting somewhere in Nagoya. And I would really appreciate if he's listening because time at this moment is not really that good. And uh, I forgot one thing, I forgot the, the commercial in the middle. How do I do the commercial? How do I get back? Okay, forget about the commercial. The commercial was just that we have delivered quite a number of lasers worldwide and we have now like 60 units. But what is the use of a narrowband laser if you don't have the right experimental equipment to resolve this, this narrowband laser light? So we can start with a broadband pulsed laser and send it into any kind of spectroscopic device. And we will get a laser bandwidth limited signal like this one, which here has something like, yes, uh, about a wave number, 30 gigahertz. So if we cut this down, we can have a half life, a half width in the order of three to five gigahertz. But we can do something. We can now use for the same conventional in-source, we can use the narrow band laser, the injection lock TISA, then we, have, we are no longer limited by the laser, we are just limited by the atomic beam profile in the ion source. And there we get something which is a little bit more narrow, but not really tremendously, it's the order of one gigahertz. So we could even do it with a not seeded, with a normal laser, which operates with two etalons and goes into the direction of one gigahertz. But in addition, we could go further we could do something like a crossed laser atomic beam geometry, which we even do at the high potential machines, at the high voltage machines, by something called the pi list. And this is then limited only by the natural line widths. And obviously, if you increase your laser power in this order, then you get separation broadening, then you decrease the natural, line, the natural lifetime of the upper state, and then you get very broad lines. But here you see the line width now is in the order of 100 megahertz and below. And this is really sufficient for doing nuclear spect for doing the spectroscopy, the high resolution spectroscopy for deriving nuclear parameters. And there are further developed approaches. We can work on supersonic gas jets. We can work on collinear fast beam laser spectroscopy. I will show you one or the other. But now let's first go back. Let's go back into ultra taste analysis because we have to do this, this uh, sidewise arabesque. In 1986, Jürgen Gluger was working together with Norbert Troutman, Ernst Otten, and uh, Gerhard Hermann, Günther Hermann in the nuclear chemistry in a really wonderful appealing lab like this one. Huge lasers, copper vapor pump lasers, which has this nice names, Grandpa, Morning Frost, and Sheila. You can imagine why they had these names because they loved to, the people loved them so much. They had a time of flight mass spectrometer and they were using the lambda physics dye lasers, huge monsters, but they were rather reliable. And in this way, one could do ultra trace analysis and also determine all the ionization potentials of 10 actinide elements very precisely. And here is a picture that at that time, which was shortly after Chernobyl, this was really a time when these days were high publicity. And we see here the measuring crew for the strontium 8919 measurements 
with the typical work, work closing, especially we see Jürgen in his typical work, uh, work closing. And we see when how the uh, media were, was promoting our work here. And this talked about strontium 90, they talked about plutonium, and they connected this with our measurements for Chernobyl. At that time, the result was something like this. So in 2000, we replaced this monsters of copper vapor lasers, which had these nice names, by a neodymium laser and the titanium sapphire lasers. That was actually the cradle of the titanium sapphire lasers, was really for the plutonium determination. And here you see a plutonium signal with rather high activity from the Mouraud at all, the French test site. Here you see a plutonium signal with a huge tracer, which has the same size like this one, just this peak is so damn small. So a very weak signal from the IRC. Fortunately, IRC is quite clean compared to the Murora at all. And there was also some scandal in the reprocessing plant at the KIT at Karlsruhe. And there we also had some samples. And I could now long discuss about the different isotopic compositions here. But this you can also read in this RBC journal from Robert Troutman down here. If we now look at present day, then this whole technology has evolved into something which is called Sirius, analytical secondary neutral mass spectrometer. Once again, you see the lasers here for resonance ionization, but you just see this is now a real commercial wonderful device, a sputter ionization, a tough time of flight mass spectrometer, which is combined with the resonance ionization. And in this way, in a nice collaboration between nuclear chemistry of mines, physics institute of mines, and the institute of radio protection and ERS, uh, the institute of Clemens Walter, the ERS at LUH, we could really generate a wonderful technology. And this wonderful technology now is capable of measuring the content of actinides in such a little fellow here. This little fellow is Bob. Bob has 10 micrometer size. He is a hot particle from Chernobyl. And Bob is somewhat a little bit active or radioactive because he has quite some uranium. He also has quite some plutonium, which you can quantify. He has some americium, and even you see hints of curium. So in a little person like this, you can really determine all the different actinides with resonance ionization in combination with spatial resolution, as you see here in this spatial element distribution in the fellow over here. So another technology sticking to plutonium, if you now want to do high resolution in plutonium, so far we didn't have high resolution, we could not really extract nuclear parameters and we want to do this. So the first thing was really done, the first measurement was done in Uvescule, and it was based by a nice coffee between Ian Moore and me at the airport Cheremetievo in, in Moscow, where we decided we want to do the heaviest element in collinear laser spectroscopy ever. And for that moment, it was plutonium. And collinear laser spectroscopy has one very, very, very good uh, advantage because you have this shift here of the ion frequency compared to the laser frequency by the velocity, the fast velocity of the ion beam, which you irradiate in the same direction of flight. So you get a huge Doppler shift. But in addition, you get a narrowing of the Doppler broadening wing because the energy is defined by the ion source and the energy distribution is a constant of the movement so if you increase your velocity like hell and get a huge frequency shift, then you decrease the relative velocity distribution, which means the spectral width of your line. And you see, if the particle just does not move, it has a broad distribution. And if the particle, all particles move with the same velocity of just 500 electron volts, uh, acceleration, 500 volt acceleration. So you get an extremely narrow peak. And this is collinear laser spectroscopy for which Rainer Neugart and Ernst Otten were, were, went, became very famous. There you could also study very nicely plutonium isotopes. You see here plutonium 239 to plutonium 40. You see a huge hyperfine structure 
in plutonium-39, you see a very nice isotope shift and you can precisely extract the, uh, the nuclear parameters. And with a continuous wave laser you use, it was a dye laser with advantage of one megahertz, you could generate something like an experimental line width of 20 megahertz. But for the sake of setting up a collinear fast ion beam laser set, can you do that also with a laser ion source? Yes, you can. You just have to create a crossed laser atom beam geometry where you have the cross geometry and you only have the perpendicular velocity distribution. And here you see, we see a little bit bigger, broader excitation lines, actually a factor of 10 broader, but still in the range we wanted to have. And this factor of 10 is due to the laser bandwidth. The laser bandwidth, if we could have a higher repetition rate pulse titanium sapphire laser with less than 20 to 30 megahertz, we could even get a, a, a more narrow line width. And then we could even resolve 241 and 239 in this transition. This is a different transition. This here was done in the ion. This was obviously done resonance ionization in the atom. So here we have only an extremely small hyperfine structure in 239, but we have a, a visible hyperfine structure in 241. And here we were not sensitive enough because it was two machineries we needed to do the ionization and then the collinear laser spectroscopy. Here we are much more sensitive, so we get one more isotope. So you see, with the laser ion source, you can almost, I wouldn't say beat, but compete with advanced high resolution facilities. How is this done? This is done by using the pi list, the perpendicular illuminated list. And the list is this laser ion source trap, which is an old idea, which was created by Jürgen and our chairperson, Klaus Blaum. And I remember a very nice weekend where Klaus Blaum, Manas Mukaimi, and me were sitting it in the old Isolde corridor at, at uh, CERN, and we're doing all the preparation, and it must have been in the year 2002. And in 2003, we started to set the system up, and we developed and developed and developed with a number of PhD students. And in 2015, Daniel Fink was the one, and, and Sven Richter, who created the first real interesting signals and results in polonium and uh, polonium, I think was the first one. And you see here, the trick is you have your ionization laser coming collinear, you have your narrow bandwidth laser system, which sits here coming perpendicular and you have this field free region in this quadrupole structure which is directly after the high voltage, the high potential ion source and easy. The acceleration into a solder or into the high voltage mass separator just comes after the list. So you see, if you just do it with the normal resonance ionization and avoid the list, so you get a lot of background on any mass and in worst case, you even get electron impact background. And if you install the pi lists and you get on your mass only the laser produced isotope. And this example here is technism, is a refractory element, which is really hard to produce. So you have to suppress any positively or negatively charged species. And this you do by all the repellers here sitting, it's two repellers actually in front of the standard ionizer, which generates all your atoms which move here and are laser excited and which generates all your charged particles, positively electrons, ions, whatever, which destroy your signal. So here's a very nice signal, the high resolution pilot spectroscopy done at Risico. We have huge hyperfine structures. We have hyperfine structures with something like 30 hyperfine components, we can do worse, we can go into holmium, then we have up to 46 hyperfine components, I will not show you that, but this perpendicular laser cannot be installed at an online facility because you have all this concrete shielding, but we can play a trick, we can also bring in the perpendicular laser with this micro mirror set here, which is not in the range of the evaporating junk of the ion source. So it really, we really demonstrated that this is a very nice way of creating this technology in the online version, which is presently installed at Asolde 
for the near future. And we have an experimental line width, which is in the order of 50 megahertz, and we have extremely low background due to all the repelling of every chunk. I have one wonderful example, which is the element promethium, because so far no one ever has put a laser onto promethium. And first of all, you have to generate promethium, and there is a very weak proton cyclotron at uh, the University of Bern, but this is strong enough to convert neodymium into the higher, the neighboring isotope, and then it decays down into all the different promethium isotopes. And you see here, we have the range of the lanthanides. And why do we discuss about promethium? Because the Lanthanides are the best ever studied range in the whole nuclear chart, except that the light ones were forgotten. forgotten. Why were they forgotten? Because they don't have stable isotopes like the promethium. They are refractory like the, like the praseodium, the cere, and the lanthanum. And these are isotopes which we like to work on. And there was just in, in promethium, there was just two isotopes done before by, by Alkasov. And so we produced something in the order of 10 to the 12 atoms. We were permitted to handle this 10 to the 12 atoms. And then we started, here are the different mass peaks of the promethium. We started to first of all develop excitation schemes, three-step excitation schemes. And then we thought to understand the nuclear structure, first understand the atomic structure. So understanding the atomic structure means we have to study the ionization potential we have to study what are all these resonances you see here. So we started with this first transition B1, we started with the second transition C1, and then my student Dominic Studer became very active and had more and more and more and more transitions that it cannot be true that we always get this ridiculous chaotic system here. And it can also not be true that we made some guesses where should the value be, so the value should be somewhere here, which is a guess from, from my, my uh, just uh, analysis of the trends in the lanthanides, which are fairly simple. It's just two straight lines very precisely, which is actually the red range. And there's a green range, which was suggested by Gordon Warden. And so somewhere here should it be. But um, from this spectrum, no one has a chance to ever discover the ionization potential. But if you do all these measurements, what you get is a lot of atomic physics. So Dominic published something like more than a thousand lines. It's a full 50 pages of supplemental or 30 pages of supplemental material in his PIA. And then he came to the idea, why not do field ionization like already ages ago, it was used at the nuclear chemistry for the actinides. So what you do is just you produce an electric field and this electric field just reduces your ionization potential. And if you just sit somewhere on one of these levels, which is a wood bag or whatever kind of level, just an excitation step, then you just see this kink here when you cross your ionization potential over the level. And if you do this, then you can just say, if I know my field strengths, then I can follow this simple saddle point metal model formula, and then I can do this for numerous different positions and numerous different wavelengths. And for each wavelength, I get something like a ionization potential and or an ionization threshold. And then this should just be a function of the square root of the field strengths. And you see here, this fits extremely well and we get a very nice value for the ionization potential. And if you have the ionization potential, then we can really study the nuclear physics. Here is now for the five isotopes, the hyperfine structure in the first two lines I showed you two slides ago. And we have a very narrow line width in the order of 100 megahertz. We have rather precise A and B factors. And now we can learn about how does in this range the nuclear physics look like. So here is now the data of promethium fit into the data which was existing on neighboring elements. So the neodymium was nicely measured and everything above. And to really analyze this data, we have to neglect the specific mass shift because no one calculates it in lanthanides. We interpolated 
the electronic F factor for the field shift from the neighboring elements. We did some electronic ratio factor from the king plot of the two different lines because they should give as a king plot, as an arrangement of the different delta frequencies, we should get something like a linear slope, which more or less is correct. And then we see it nicely fits here. And we nicely learn now also about the nuclear structure of promethium. And in the next periods, this data should be extended at Isolde into the short-lived range. So from promethium, I promised you, we are getting to the end of this talk. Uh, I promised you we want to go into the direction of actinite, but on the way to actinite, we stop at estatine because meanwhile, in 2018, there was quite some activity and there were all these isotopes from 195 to 211 measured. So this is altogether 16 isotopes you see here and even 16 isotopes with additional isomers and does not this remind you something like a little bit, was it not like mercury and it was I equals one half is the isomers and I equals seven half nuclear spin is the ground states. And here you see this measurement was still done with broadband. So the resolution is rather lousy, but as the transition is rather easy, you can fit in those eight to 10 components and get your data on hyperfine structure and on the, the uh, center of gravity, which is this black dotted line here, very precisely. And so, and you use the MR TOF again for the detection, you used for the long lift on the Faraday cup, and you use the windmill. So again, the whole system of different detectors was used, just like in this very early, in this very recent mercury measurement. And if I compare this, then we see again our octopole deformation up here. We see our mercury flip-flop nuclei, and we have something rather similar. We have a almost a renaissance of the mercury shape staggering we find in the acetine and the acetine sequence fits very well into polonium and radium neighbors. And we have this sequence here where we have this, this flip-flop nuclei. And you see here, in one half prolate isomers in mercury and in acetine and almost spherical nuclei with seven half below or with three half above in above this range of the flip flop nuclei. So very stimulating that we now have a very clear picture on the nuclear structure up to thorium. And here at thorium, we are at the border of the actinides. Here is thorium. And if we now look into the field of the actinides, we see now it's really getting hard to produce long isotope range. So there's a uranium isotope chain. And here's see a nice two-dimensional high resolution resonance ionization picture on 233 to 236 uranium plus the almost stable 238 uranium. And there is a frequency detuning of the first step excitation, the frequency detuning of the second step. And you see Uranium, where we have a huge peak, which is red because the, the detector ran into overload. 236, we have a small peak. 243, we have a small peak. And then you see a huge hyperfine structure, which is really hard to analyze in 235 and also in 233. So this chain we can have. We also already had the plutonium chain. The curium shame there actually, this is work in progress by my student Nina Kneipp, who will publish it in several papers, I hope, if I do correct them, and in her dissertation in 22. And then above here, we still have still shorter chains, but these will be isotopes which are mainly accessible online at GSI. And this is a work by Michael, Mustafa, and Sebastian. And there's just one mistake. Einsteinium 254. I will just show you Einsteinium 254 because, sorry, one moment. <clears throat> because to do all the spectroscopy in the actinides, we first need all the two step ionization schemes. And we have chosen by now the most simple and the most efficient two step excitation schemes. They are rapidly interchangeable. And this all is developed at, in my lab. I'm, I'm quite happy about all these active students. 
And in this way, we can do element selective isotope de determination and high resolution spectroscopy, even in mixture samples where you have different actinides coming together in one sample, because you cannot easily separate them in a, in a nuclear chemical way. So we have all these excitation schemes available. And if you now put in a throw in a sample, then you can really see this is our plutonium peaks. This is there's a blue plutonium peak underneath this yellow uh, americium peak. There is a curium peaks here. There is a percalium peak, there's californium. So you can really select out of your huge mixed sample with resonance ionization, you can select individual actinides. And this was all prepared by having this specific lasers prepared in the lanthanide series, which is also very interesting that you can deconvolute or de de resolve a sample of different lanthanides. And this is the optimum situation that we can really go to a very low background by just selecting one isotope. And the one I want to show you is exactly this Einsteinium 254, because it's really work in progress where we were in principle expecting the next sample to arrive from um, Oak Ridge these days, but the pandemic has postponed everything and made everything rather complicated. And so if you look at the excitation schemes development with broadband lasers in Einsteinium, we see how much work is needed to find a really suitable hyperfine structure to learn about the nuclear physics. So I think at least one, two, four, three, four, five samples, uh, excitation schemes are completely useless because you cannot resolve a thing and you cannot even resolve if you take a narrow band laser which you can just take after you've understood the broadband excitation, you will not even resolve anything here. This one is a very promising candidate. This one is another promising candidate. And this is work in progress by Stephen Helfer, Not Helfer, the PhD student of Michael Block. And altogether in completing the level schemes of the actinides, we learn a lot about this high excitation levels around the ionization potentials as well above as well below. But sometimes there are also funny things missing. For example, here in actinides, uh, in actinium, not in actin, the one actinide actinium, there we found that it was a suggestion by Dima Butka that these two levels are not, have never been found with any end. We could manage to detect this lowest lying or parity atomic levels using um, resonance ionization in actinium in a very nice application here. So we can localize any missing levels. We can create these, or we can um, remove these white spots where no levels are known. And you see the further up you go, the more white you have. We can identify for many of those levels, the electron angular momentum quantum number J, and we can precise redetermine or first ever determine the ionization potential. And presently for first ever determination, it's just fermium and mendelevium left over. Michael Block has covered nobelium. The other ones have been covered in nuclear chemistry. And now we are just reproducing these numbers and redetermine making them a little bit more precise. So, I'm at the end. We are on the way to the nuclear structure, structure of the actinides and beyond is still beyond in the future, but there is already some knowledge about these uh, short isotopic chains I showed you here. This is a nice picture by Sebastian Reda where he just did not put the different isotope, the different elements on the right level of the overall um, charge radius because the overall number is not known here. So you have to guess something and it just compared the different trends of these different curves and they all fit very well. And so we are on the way to give more information and to learn also in this region. And there we have a huge network, which is extremely positive, a network of an international training network of the EU Horizon 2020 with all together 15 students and all the big institutions involved. And it's a lot of pleasure to work together in this framework. So I come to the end.
And I think it's good that I come to the end. Online and offline high resolution RIS. I hope you have seen a few examples that this is an optimum tool for nuclear parameter studies, determination, and also for ultra trace analysis. High spectral resolution using pulse lasers is nowadays possible. What you have to do is you have to do seeding, you have to do injection locking, and I also showed you that your arrangements, your experimental arrangements must be chosen suitable. And you can, for highest precision, obviously you profit from collinear laser interaction where you have extremely narrow bandwidths, but you can also directly use the in-source spectroscopy in a proper way with pilots and similar approaches. Or like you have to do at the online work, you have to go into gas jets with hypersonic gas jets, which are nicely focused, very good beams. The spectroscopic ar arrangements of relevance, the cross beam geometry in the ion source, the collinear fast, or so many R's in laser, or alternatively the supersonic, I mentioned this. And you can even do two photon excitation, just the efficiency is not really convincing. And I showed you some striking results from my resolution laser spectroscopy on exotic species. I just want to show out the promethium is wonderful thing, the technetium is nice, the holmium we did. And they elucidate nuclear structure along the nuclear chart from hydrogen and then I say up to somewhere because now we are somewhere in the beginning of the actinides. And I showed a few pictures of Jürgen and I think I should really once again point out very special emphasis should be given to Jürgen for his contributions in this field of laser spectroscopy and his ideas in this field of laser spectroscopy. And you should not only connect Jürgen's name all the time with precision mass determination. In the field of laser spectroscopy, he contributed as much. And if I now come to say a few words to Jürgen, I say, Jürgen, I'm personally very, very grateful for everything you taught me. And I looked into my list of references and we just have 19 papers together. It's not so many. I think before I retire, I want to at least get up to 25 or so. So Jürgen, I heard that you had a very nice birthday on Sunday and I've even personally met you on Monday. That was great. And I wish you everything you want and everything which is written on this card. And in addition, I wish you many more nature, science, and PLs on so fascinating research like we have done together or like you have done in a few years in the past. And finally, I thank all the people in my computer screen for your online attention and for surviving my talk. Thank you. <laughs>